How many are ready for the word? All right, we're going to get, we're going to go to Bible college in this service. Is that okay? I think, although I do feel a prophetic unction, so we'll just see what happens. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll just see what happens. But I'll start off with this and then we'll see what happens. There was a burglar who broke into a house and he was stealing a TV off the wall. And as he was stealing the TV, he heard this voice came out from the dark and said, Jesus is watching you. And the burglar was like, whoa, he, he froze in his tracks and he, he, he shined his light and he saw that there was a parrot on a perch. And he said, did you say that to me? And the parrot said, yes, I'm just trying to warn you. And he said, warn me? What are you talking about? What's your name? And the parrot said, my name is Moses. And he said, what kind of name is Moses? And the parrot said, the people who name people, Mo parrots, Moses are the same people who name 150-pound Rottweilers, Jesus. Okay, I could spit that out. I could spit that out. <laughs> Two people got that. Okay. So we're talking about encountering yourself. Somebody say encountering yourself. Ooh, it's a tough crowd. All right, good. Somebody say encountering yourself. <laughs> Amen. Last week we began this series, and we talked about God chose us, God made us. And in the first service we talked about I am Joseph, and we share the story of Joseph and now in this next sermon, we're going to be talking about I am metamorphosing. How many of you have ever heard, have ever heard of metamorphosis, transformation? And so one of the things we talked about was when you encounter God, and can I define a God encounter? A God encounter is a real, genuine, authentic experience with Jesus that sticks with you for a lifetime. I don't know about you, but I don't want to just come to church and then just miss out on something or just get a little bit of Jesus. I got to get enough of Jesus to make it through the week. But there's another level where all of a sudden I have a real, genuine, authentic experience with Jesus that sticks with me for a lifetime. It stays with me. There's something that happens when I have a God encounter. Is there anyone in this house who wants to have a God encounter? Amen. There's something powerful that takes place when you encounter God. When you encounter whose you are, you will also encounter who you are. You'll discover who you are when you're in his presence. In his presence, David said in Psalm 16, I'm going to start preaching up in here, there's fullness of joy and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Now I want you to read with me the key verse for the month from Psalm chapter 100 verse 3 and you could stand with me, in fact, for the reading of the word. We just want to honor God's word here today. And Psalms 100, verse 3, and we're going to read like we did last week. Ready? No. Do they have it? That's the key statement. We'll read that in a second. All right, I'll read it. Know that the, somebody just repeat after me. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. How many know, there it is, know that the Lord, he is God. When you know, then you can flow and you can grow and you can go. When you know, there's something about having knowledge. When you know the Lord, he is God. He is on the throne. He is sovereign. He rules over all of the earth. And no matter what you are facing in this life, he is God and God alone. And he is sovereign and he does what he wants to, when he wants to, how he wants to, where he wants to, with whom he wants to. I told you I might start preaching up in here you got to know that he is God. Let us follow on to know the Lord, Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. He's going forth. He's going forth. And he's going forth like the rain, like the former and the latter rain upon the earth. I'll put my verse back up. Know that he is God. And watch this. This is our key phrase for the month. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We didn't, we're, not, we're not doing this thing. This is not up to us, it's up to him. And he made us. How many know he made you? You are God's creation. You are the apple of his eye. The reason you're here right now, the reason you're breathing right now is because of God. God made you, and because God made you, you are special. 
Woo, I'm talking to the church up in here. You weren't an accident. You were not a mistake. Come on now. You weren't the result of a one-night stand. God had a purpose for your days, and he allowed you to come forth. Now I'm preaching up in here. And it is he who made us and not we ourselves. And there it is. We are his people. If my people, my people. There's a script people in the scripture called my people. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves. There's something about knowing that you are God's people. There's something about knowing that you are in the family. That you are in the family of God. So I love this verse. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Now let's read the key statement for the month of January. And you know it rhymes. It always rhymes. Can't help myself. One, two, three, boom. I'm a Jedi. Ready? In this month of meeting, me, myself, and I, it has come to my attention that God has drawn nigh to give me a fresh and supernatural supply of his divine revelation for my life. My past, my present, and my future all belong to him. He is the author of my life, and I know I'm not a whim. I'm a child of the living God, accepted and adored. I am chosen, called, anointed. It's him I'm living for. Now I'm moving forward in this amazing life as I continue to discover me, myself, and I. Lift your hands to heaven. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to move in this time in your presence, and in your word. Speak today for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody said, get your prophetic bony finger. Don't sit down. Put it in your neighbor's face and tell them you, come on, tell them you are about to experience breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough because what you went through did not break you. Be seated, be seated. You are about to experience breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough because what you went through did not break you. How many know it tried to break you? How many have had some things in your life that tried to break you down and destroy your life and to steal your joy huh, and to take your mind whew, and, and, and to cause your future to end? But God says, I know the plans that I have for you. I know the thoughts that I have for you and the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. And I have thoughts about you that outnumber the sands of the sea. They outnumber the hairs on your head. And I have thoughts about you and they are of good and not of evil. And they give you a hope and a future. Can I speak a hope and a future to somebody up in here? There's a hope and a future that God is giving you in your life. I'm going to start preaching and then I might start prophesying. Because <clears throat> I feel this unction. There is a story of a woman, her name was Angela Posey, and her husband had recently passed, and she went down to the ocean. How many like to go down to the ocean sometimes? She went down to the ocean just to sit by the water and to relax and to process the death of her husband, and while she was there, this is a true story, she observed all this trash that was piling up. It was coming out of the ocean and piling up on the beaches. And she thought to herself, I need to do something about this. And so she started this, this nonprofit organization called Washed Ashore. And it is basically art to save the sea. And so what she would do is she would take plastic from the sea and she would turn it into art. In fact, I have a few pictures of some of the from some of the art for you of what they've done. And literally over the last 15 years, they've taken plastic from the beaches and fit over 10,000 people have volunteered to remove the plastic and the garbage from the beaches. And what they did was they've turned it into art. Angela was an artist who made a decision. And see, she said, guess what? She said, I'm going to take what is a blight and I'm going to change its plight. I'm going to take something that was bad, and I'm going to make it good. I'm going to take something huh, that somebody calls trash, and I have a brilliant idea. I'm going to make it art. She was a designer. Isn't that how God works, by the way? He takes all the trash, all the junk, and turns it into a beautiful masterpiece. How many know that God is the original artisan? 
He's the original artist. Before there was a Michelangelo, before there was a Leonardo da Vinci, before a Pablo Picasso, before a Patrick Keitley. God was the original artist. And how did he work? What was his first substance? In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, God took mud. He took dirt and he formed man and he made man out of the dust of the earth and he breathed the breath of life into his nostrils and man became a living soul. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, Paul tells the church, he says, for we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Can you look at somebody beside you and tell them, you are his workmanship? When you look in the Greek, it's very interesting because Paul was, was referring to our life of sin and in this fallen world, and sin makes the beach dirty in our lives. Sin is the trash that's in our lives. And in the Greek, it's interesting because God will take what is ugly, what is unsightly, what is a blight, what is unacceptable in our lives, and what has corrupted us, and he'll change it for good. And so the word workmanship in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, we are his workmanship. The word workmanship in the Greek means an invention. This is the Greek. Or a work of art, or a creation created by or produced by an artisan. God was the original artist. And he took us, come on now, and that's the Greek word poema, which we get the word poem from. And God was the one, the original artist, when Adam and Eve sinned, when they fell into corruption. Can I preach the gospel here for a, for a second? When they fell into corruption, God said, I'm not going to leave my creation in corruption. I'm, gonna, I'm the original artist, and so, so, so I'm going to begin creating again through Christ Jesus. See, he's preaching the gospel here, and now all of a sudden, he creates a new creation by faith. Come on, through grace. He does a work, and he creates a new creation, and all things have passed away, and behold, all things are made new, and we take on a new nature in Jesus, and we have the fruit of the Holy Spirit, because what happens is we get a, become a new creation, and we become a temple of the Holy Spirit, and we have the indwelling, and the infilling, and the instilling of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and when the Holy Spirit is in our lives, we have this thing called the fruit fruit of the Holy Spirit. And now all of a sudden there's love that I did not have before. There's joy that the world can't give and the world can't take away. And there's peace that, that restores my soul and my mind and my heart and establishes things. There's gentleness. There's meekness. There's self-control. Uh-oh, I'm getting into people's business up in here. And there's patience. And there's all this stuff that is connected to the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, I'm just going to throw this out there. Some Christians need a little bit more Holy Spirit so we can get a little more fruit of the Holy Spirit because you need to be a little nicer. I'm not talking to, I'm not talking to anyone in particular. It was the first service people I was talking about. But we're encountering ourselves. Somebody say now. So we're in an hour of, and you can, if you're writing notes, of Romans chapter 8. Verses 14, 19, and 22. Do you have that? Can, can, I, can I read those verses? Okay, let's go with Romans 8, 14. It says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the, what? Sons of God. Can somebody say that again? The sons of God. Now, within sons, there are also daughters, okay? My grandpa used to say, some of God's greatest men in the kingdom are women. <laughs> For as many as are led oh, by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now you go to verse 19 of chapter 8, and it says, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of what? The Sons of God. So there's this company called the Sons of God. And then verse 22 says, for we know that the whole creation groans. Somebody say groan. Groan. It's, it's, it's unutterable utterances. It are words beyond speech. There's something in your spirit that is beyond speech. You can't put words to it, so you groan. Have you ever heard a child groan? Have you ever heard a dog groan? Have you ever heard somebody in pain groan? 
The earth groans and labors with birth pangs together until what? Now. And so we're in the hour of Romans 8, 14 through 22, where creation is waiting. Can somebody say waiting? I love what the King James says. It says, it waiteth, it groaneth, it travaileth. There's a little F at the end. It just sounds really, doesn't that sound churchy kind of? It waiteth. It's like Shakespeare or something like that. It groaneth. It travaileth. There's something happening in creation that is waiting for a company of people called the sons of God. A manifestation, a coming forth of a company of people called the sons of God. And so Romans says, the earth is tormented. The earth is in pain. It is afflicted. And it, watch this, groans together. So it's not just one part of creation, all of creation. You're wondering why all these earthquakes and all this stuff. Creation's groaning. The earth is shaking. It's looking for a company of people. I'm building something here called the sons of God. There's something that is, 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 is happening in the earth. It's like a birthing mother that's groaning. All of creation groans, it says, until now. Can somebody say now? So now we started this series. Huh. with this statement last week. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Can somebody say, I am a child of God? How many know that you are a child of God? You are a child of God, and as a child of God, we have a few things. One, the Father is all our daddy. So guess what? We're family. And I love God's family because it's eclectic and it's wonderful and we all don't look the same. Come on, somebody. I love it. It's red and yellow and black and, and brown and white folk even. And if you notice, I'm about as white as they come. There's a, I have a shade. My shade is called translucent. But... but in, it, we have, we're all in the same family, and we all have a seat at the table. And we all are accepted, and we're loved, and we're chosen. And we need to hear this, because if we look at it by the world's standards, everything wants to divide. You see, now I'm going to get into my prophetic mode here. Because in 2024, the spirit that's written over this year is the spirit of division. And everything wants to divide. And any way, can I give you a secret here? So you don't, don't, are not fooled by CNN and Fox? Two people, okay, good. I had one person clap. I'm going to give you a secret. Everything is out to divide us. Whew. Divide us economically, relationally, racially, culturally, politically. It's out to divide us. But we're not children of the darkness. We're children of the light. And like I always say, Sister Sledge says, we are family. And so what makes us children of God is we have a heavenly father who loves all of us. We also have a brother. The original brother is Jesus. And we are, watch this, now you're going to catch something, and we are heirs. Did you know you're an heir? We are joint heirs with Jesus. We are joint heirs with each other. We are heirs. Now, I tried to grab a picture of some families that were, that were heirs, because imagine being a Rockefeller or a Windsor. You know who the Windsors are? The royal family of Israel. I mean, of Israel, of England. Or a Durst, or any other family member. They're heirs. And what do they do? What are they, what, how are they to heirs? They're born into money, 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 money. It's like what Steve Harvey says. He says, when he talks about Michael Jackson, he goes, Michael Jackson has money he can't count. Michael Jackson has giraffe money. He said, he said Michael Jackson has giraffes in his backyard, Neverland. 
You don't even know where to get a giraffe yourself, but he has giraffe money. Can you imagine as an heir you have giraffe money? Do you have money that you can't even count because you were an heir and you were born into extravagant wealth and you don't even have to lift a finger because you are royal and you are born into this family that is so wealthy. And see, I got to tell you, that's something in the natural, but let's talk about what we have in the spiritual because that's what you have. You are an heir come on now, to the kingdom of heaven. And if you get connected to the kingdom of heaven, in heaven the streets are made of gold. Woo! Some people want to take their gold with them to heaven. Forget it. That's the sidewalk. You know what I'm saying? That's the pavement up in heaven. That's just, it's a sea of glass up there, and the throne is an emerald, and it's, it's, it's wealth and riches. And, and you got to understand that you are an heir of the kingdom of heaven. And in the kingdom of heaven, no one's sick. No one's tired. No one has COVID. Hallelujah. No one is fighting. There's no war. There's peace. And you are an heir of the kingdom of heaven. Can somebody say now? So when you look in Romans chapter 8, I want you to hear something because I'm I'm laying something down here and then we're going to just move. In Romans chapter 8, it doesn't say, remember what the phrase said? The sons of God. It does not say that creation is waiting for children. Creation is not waiting, groaning, travailing, laboring for children. Children is not the language. The language is very specific. The scripture is very clear. It says creation longs for what? Sons and daughters. Sons. Isaiah 9, since you're taking amazing notes, And verse 6 says this verse. Remember this at Christmas. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Somebody say child. Somebody say son. And so the word child in the Hebrew is yaled, Y-A-L-A-D. And it means to begot, to birth. Unto us a child, a child is born, but unto us... A son is given, niton in the Hebrew, and niton means to put, to set, to place as a unique gift. So a son is given, a son is a unique gift that I am given. And so you realize that there's a distinction in this scripture, because here's the thing. Everyone is born a child, but not everyone becomes a son. And so how do you move from childhood To son ship, you have to grow. Read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. Don't read your Bible and pray every day. Pray every day, pray every day. Don't read your Bible and you won't. Don't pray every day and you'll shrink, shrink, shrink. There's something about growing. Something that is healthy is growing. If you plant a strawberry seed in a pot, you want it to grow. So you water it, you make sure it has sunlight, you put it into the right environment and temperature, and you want it to grow. Why? Why do you want your strawberry plant to grow? Because you want strawberry shortcake. Somebody's alive in here. But not everyone moves from childhood into sonship. And here's an announcement. That means that many adults are still children. Is he preaching up? I told you I was going to Bible college here. And if they're still children, then they can't handle major decisions. They can't deal with real responsibility. Oh, they can't have meaningful relationships or grow beyond their measure until one matures. They are excluded from certain responsibilities. Now, I hope you got my pictures up in here because you don't put a nine-month-old baby in the cockpit of an airplane to be the pilot. You got my pictures? (laughs) 
You don't vote a five-year-old, no matter what party you, you're on. You don't vote a five-year-old in to be the president of the United States. You don't send a seven-year-old to the front lines of a battle. Is that right? <laughs> Imagine sending these people. Imagine this is your pilot. This is your pilot. This is your The pilot has to have his diaper changed right now. <laughs> the president of the United States needs a nap. Oh, did I say that? Certain responsibilities require certain levels of maturity. See, I'm, I'm, I'm causing you to move on up here to, the, to another level. And so, like, for instance, childproof bottles. Have you ever tried to open up a childproof bottle and you couldn't get it open? I'm sitting there going, okay, put the arrows together, pop down and turn. A childproof uh, uh, bottle requires a certain skill based on your maturity level that, that keeps it closed or opens it up. And so there's a story of a little girl who was rummaging through her mother's purse and she found this bottle of pills and she was struggling and struggling and trying to get this thing open and finally she got frustrated and she said, Mom, why can't I open it? And the mother said, because you are a child. And a little girl asked the best question ever. Well, how does it know that I'm a child? It's because of your maturity level. It requires maturity to open up particular things. I, I, I'm, I'm speaking to somebody here. And see, because why? God doesn't entrust, entrust us with authority if we're acting like children. He gives authority to sons. And in the kingdom, we have too many grown children who have not stepped into maturity. And so because they've not stepped into maturity, they're still suffering the same afflictions, the same sicknesses, the same divorces, the same situations that the world is suffering. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says, now. Can somebody say now? Now I say that the heir... As long as he is a child, doesn't differ at all from a slave. Though he is a master of all, but he is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed of the father. He's under governors and tutors as long as an heir. Can somebody say, I am an heir? is still not mature, is still not acting like a child, then the throne is put under regency. It's put under the rule of another until one is ready to step into that place, and so there's no freedom to exercise authority. See, I don't know if you know I'm going somewhere. And so, and so if I were you, I'd be taking notes a little bit more because there's something powerful that God's releasing in this time. He's not allowed to exercise authority before his time until maturity is reached. And so in the kingdom of God, we have many people who are being robbed by the enemy, huh, not because of right, but because they refuse to grow. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, newborn babes desire milk, pure milk of the word to grow. Babies want milk. Is that true? But sons want meat. Woo! How many would just love to go the end of the service to Bubba's? And you just walk up and say, what, can I take your order, please? One gallon of milk, please. <laughs> See, Pastor Patrick, I have a problem with milk. I can't do milk. It's not just, it's not just like lactose. It's I have a mental block with milk. Can I share it with you? Like there's just certain things about dairy, like cottage cheese. Like, okay, think about this. Sour cream. 
Hello? Think, just think about it for a minute. But milk, can I, can, I, can, I, can I be graphic for a minute? When you look at mammals, mammals don't drink each other's milk. Is he really preaching about this? Yes, he is. You don't see a squirrel hanging in the side of a deer trying to get his milk. Huh. And so I just, myself personally, I'm just, I'm beyond milk. I don't need no milk. If I have any milk, it's coconut or almond milk, and that's it. But I don't need no dairy, no, I don't have enzymes in my stomach to digest that stuff. But babies, they grow off of milk. But if you go to Bubba's and order a gallon of milk, they're going to look at you like you're crazy. Just go to H-E-B real quick, get your own milk, because we're going to charge you $8.95 for a gallon of milk. When you go to Bubba's, what do you want? You want meat. Is that right? Wings. We'll meet you there. You go to Texas Roadhouse. I want the ribeye. Now I'm getting hungry. When I start preaching about food, I'm getting hungry. I go to Longhorn. I want the porterhouse. Somebody's getting a revelation up in here. I don't want milk. I don't go to restaurants to order milk. I go there to get some meat. Somebody's got a revelation here. And so when we want to grow, we need meat. And one must grow. We must grow. We have to grow. God's raising up a church in this hour that's going to grow. I'm not just talking about numerically. I'm talking about personally. Grow in your walk with Jesus. I'm metamorphosing. I'm growing in my walk with Jesus. I'm not just going to stay a larvae. I'm growing in my walk with Jesus. I'm not going to walk around just being a caterpillar. I'm growing in my walk with Jesus. I'm going to go into the cocoon for a season and sit in the dark. But I'm growing and I'm going to crystallize in the cocoon. And I'm going to bust out and I'm going to be a butterfly. Can somebody say butterfly? Butterflies were born to fly. Caterpillars don't fly. Butterflies do. Ha, caterpillars don't multiply. I was born to multiply. Caterpillars don't multiply. Butterflies do. And so guess what, baby? I'm metamorphosizing. Metamorphosing. I am cause I'm changing. I'm being transformed from being child a child to becoming a son. I'm being raised up, ha, huh, like Jesus said in John chapter 1 and verse 21, to as many as received him. To them he gave the power to become the sons of God. There's a power to become the sons of God. Do you realize that the first son of God, Jesus, had to grow himself? He was born a child. And had to become a son. You read Luke chapter 2 verse 52. For those of you writing the scriptures down. It says, and Jesus increased in wisdom. He increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with man and God and man. And that word increase in the Greek means to keep increasing. It means, it also speaks of a cutting away like a pioneer who cuts the brushwood. And the forest back and makes a way. And I'm increasing. And so I'm increasing my territory. I'm enlarging my territory. And Jesus kept increasing. And so you look at Jesus and the whole story of Jesus. When in Luke chapter 4, when he was water baptized, there was a voice that came from heaven. This is my beloved child. No, no. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And the Holy Spirit came upon him. You flip over to Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5. And another voice, the voice of the Father came again and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. He's the one. And at that point, Jesus was transfigured. There's something that happens when the voice of God is spoken over your life and says, You've moved from childhood into sonship. All of a sudden, you are transfigured and you are changed. And then Jesus flips it in John chapter 20 and verse 21. And he says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And now you're stepping into this thing. You are stepping into sonship. You're stepping into a whole new environment. Why? 
Because you are going to provide answers to the world. You are going to bring healing to people who are sick. What if, can I throw a prophetic what if in here? What if somebody in this place had an anointing, a hospital emptying anointing released upon you? Well, you walked into hospitals and just everyone just starts getting out of bed. Peter walked down the street and people were just getting up out of getting healed and blind were getting healed, just walking down the street from his shadow. Huh. He was walking the street. He, they, they took pieces of his garment and they took them like healing cloths to people. And there was an impartation in the healing cloth and people were getting healed. See, you are the one. You look in Isaiah chapter 61 who was anointed. To bring people out of sickness, out of poverty, out of disease. Isn't that what we are called to do? Because guess what? It's called the manifestation of the sons of God. Woo! And what I'm looking at, and here's what I want to prophesy, and then I'll move now. Is that 2024 is a year of transformation. You are being transformed. Can I make, can, can, can I tell somebody, can I just talk to you personally? Everything that you've gone through up until now in your life has been preparation hmm. for what you're about to step into. The good, the bad, and the ugly. How many have seen some ugly? <laughs> Unfortunately, we see ugly in church sometimes. Did I say that? What does Urkel say? Did I do that? <sighs> but God takes it all and he works it for good. Woo! And he says, I'm causing you to grow up. 2024, I walked into 2024 and the Lord said, tell my church that this is a year of quick growth, of maturity. You know, like the bamboo? For three years, it grows three feet, and then just all of a sudden, within a short period of time, it just sprouts out, becomes 90 feet. See, some of you, this is your sprout out year. You're about to explode forth. You're about to grow. And one of the things God is doing is he's saying, I'm taking people. See, I love that scripture in 1 Corinthians 13. I'm just off this. Where it says, when I was a child, I acted like a child. I thought like a child. I spoke like a child. But when I became a man, when I became a son, see, there's a manifestation of sons in this hour. People who are going to walk into their spheres of influence as a son in their authority, moving in the power of the Holy Spirit, changing environments and atmospheres. Colleen! should not stay the same because you're here. Because you are an atmosphere changer. And you're changing every single atmosphere that you're in. And so I'm telling somebody in this room right now. In fact, Sister Barbara, let me give you something. You were ministering in the first service, and the Lord told me two things. One, there are certain times and places where you were misunderstood, and it brought you frustration. And the spirit of rejection, gossip, and even lies were spoken. And there's a lot of pain. But God says, I'm causing restoration to come to you in this day. This is a moment of restoration. Everything, like I said to everybody else here, has been preparatory for what God wants to do now. One of the reasons people misunderstand you is because you have an anointing to pull people out of their comfort zone. Even when you're leading worship, I was watching you today, I was like, she's pulling people higher. You're pulling people to another level. And so keep doing what you're doing. I heard the Lord say, keep doing what you're doing. Ha, because you are necessary. You are crucial. And may I? Wipe off the residue, the dust of yesterday. And I remove the arrows, the fiery darts that have been shot in your back. And God shines his light on you. And he says, this is a moment. And here's the second part of it. Where I'm going to be Jehovah Jireh to you. 
there's a supernatural supply that's coming to you, mighty woman of God. And where there's been, seemed like struggle and just wondering how this is going to happen and that's going to happen, God says there's blessing that's been stored up for you for this time, one, but also the thief has to restore back to you seven times what he took from you. I'm telling you, there's a seven-fold return back to you. Jehovah Jireh is over you today. And he says, watch and see, quick works. Next 90 days, things are changing right before your eyes. Where stuff that would take 10 years to happen is going to happen like that. God's accelerating it in your life in this time. So stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. For your deliverance draweth nigh unto you, says the Spirit of the Lord. You see, I'm talking to church here today. And the Lord's saying, I'm causing my sons and daughters to rise. And you're metamorphosizing now. Some of you have been in the cocoon. Woo! Some of you have been in the dark. Has anyone ever been in a dark place? And you just felt like you're just in the dark place. You, 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 you crawled into that place. Huh. But you're going to fly out of it when it's over. And I got a prophetic announcement for somebody in this room. Woo! That you're coming out of the cocoon. And you're about to soar in 24. It's going to be a year of victory. It's going to be a year woo, of authority. It's time for us to step in authority. Jesus said, you will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. He doesn't say you're just going to fight and fight and fight and contend and wait and wait and wait. There's a certain level of authority that you step into where all of a sudden demons, you have to leave. Principalities and powers, I'm sorry, but you can't stay. <laughs> Generational patterns that have tried to be in your life, you got to go. Here's, here, here's my deal with you, because I'm more having more like a fireside chat with you here today. It's a prophetic moment. Here's my deal with you. If that's okay, can I, can I have a deal with you? We're going to lean into God this year. This is a year of divine encounters. And we're going to see more done in this year than we've ever seen in any year before. Some of you have prayer requests that have been lingering. Some of you have prayer lists that are a mile long. Some of you have been frustrated and saying, God, how long? Has anyone ever prayed that prayer? God, how long? Really, seriously. I mean, okay, I got it. No, really, I got it. I mean, I got it. <laughs> let's do this. This is a year where God's looking back at you and saying, let's do this. I'm ready to perform my word. 